Take a look at this chart. It shows how many goods and services people sell worldwide in a particular year. Here, the Roman Empire collapsed. Here, Prophet Muhammad was born. Here is an invention of the compass, the printing press, and the steam engine. But nothing could really change this slow and smooth growth. So what led to this explosive rise after the 1950s? You see, one of the main drivers of human development is trade. Many great cities evolved from markets. Sailors discovered new continents trying to figure another trade route. Bank and insurance companies created new financial instruments to sponsor international trading companies. But even at the beginning of the 20th century, Cargo ships and ports were way too inefficient. Goods were stored in bags, chests, and barrels. By hand, they were taken, rolled, and lifted to the cargo ship. It was slow, expensive, and dangerous, since the goods could be broken, lost, or stolen. In the 1950s, Malcolm McLean, owner of a trucking business, came up with an idea to take a trailer from the truck itself and put it onto the cargo ship, skipping the unloading step. This simple idea revolutionized the world of trade making shipping 30 times cheaper and 100 times faster. From that time, global GDP has been growing exponentially. Right now, over 80% of goods are delivered by ships as the most cost-effective transport. Thousands of cargo ships are in the ocean right now. Even if we hid the continents from the map, you'll still be able to recognize them. On this map, you can see the busiest ports in the world, such as Shanghai, Rotterdam, and Los Angeles, as well as the world economy bottlenecks, such as Suez, Panama, or Bosphorus Canal. These canals allow shipping companies to save billions of dollars in hundreds of days while delivering a new iPhone right to your door. However, two of the most important corridors in the world are in danger. One in the Middle East because of the ongoing conflict, and another in South America because of climate change. But how is it possible that these elements of the modern world are so vital and vulnerable at the same time? Let's try to answer that question. This is the Suez Canal. Probably the most famous canal in the world due to a recent incident with Ever Given. And definitely the busiest one because that blockage cost the global economy over 9 billion dollars. But exactly 170 years ago, this place was just a wasteland. Traders were spending days in camel-bound caravans transporting goods from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea. So even pharaohs were thinking about digging a canal in that place. However, it was only in 1854 that the French diplomat Ferdinand de Lesseps came to this place with European money and negotiated with Egypt's leader to build this canal. Egypt agreed to receive only 15% of the net profits from the canal and even for this, the country had to take out a huge debt with a relatively high interest rate. After 15 years of construction, 74 million cubic meters of dirt, 100 million dollars, and thousands of deaths among Egyptian workers, the canal was officially opened. Ferdinand de Lesseps celebrated and took the first ship to America, hoping to repeat his success with another ambitious project. Only in 1956, Egyptian leader Gamal Abdel Nasser declared the nationalization of the Suez Canal and later paid out all obligations to the stakeholders. Nowadays, the canal plays a significant role in the world's economy. Roughly 30% of the world's shipping container volume is transported through it. The canal saves 50% of the sailing time and $250,000 per trip, and brings $9 billion to Egypt's budget. But all these benefits are now in danger because of the ongoing conflict in the Middle East. The largest shipping firms are pausing shipments through the canal after Houthi attacks. Rerouting around the Cape of Good Hope may require up to $1 million in extra fuel. Of course, every conflict will eventually end up with negotiations, but we can't make a deal with nature. As I said earlier, Ferdinand de Lesseps didn't want to bask in glory, and right after the success of the Suez Canal, he started to plan another enormous project. In 1881, backed by popularity and huge investments, he came to this small land bridge between South and North America. But he didn't realize that unlike the flat, arid desert of Suez, Panama was a tropical jungle with rains, heat, mountains, and tropical diseases. His plan was the same as for the Suez Canal, to dig a trench at the sea level connecting two coasts. But for this terrain, his machinery was far too light, and workers weren't prepared enough. So after losing $287 million and 22,000 workers' lives, the French abandoned the project. That's when Americans realized it'd be a great to succeed where the French failed. At the time, Panama was part of Colombia and planned to gain independence. Sensing an excellent deal, Theodore Roosevelt decided to step in. With the big brother on their side and military support, Panama became independent from Colombia in 1903 and let the US work on the canal. American engineers abandoned the sea level digging approach and focused on another technique, a high level canal with locks. Instead of digging the ground to the sea level, they started to build multiple locks with different water levels. 
This system was cheaper, but required a huge water source for ships when they reached the top level. So the engineers decided to flood the valley with the biggest dam ever built. In 1913, the artificially made Gutan Lake and the locks were ready to meet the first cargo ship. 86 years later, Panama gained total control over the canal. But the US still hold the right to defend the canal against any threats to its neutrality. But the current threat is not what you can be protected from. Right now, the canal accounts for about 2.5% of the world's shipping container volume. Sounds like not that much, but it also covers around 57% of the total cargo transported from Asia to the US. Due to climate change, Gatun Lake suffered from severe droughts for the last several years. This made the Panama Canal Authority limit the number of ships per day by 30%, all the way down to 24 per day, with slots to be prioritized according to the highest bid in auction processes. And if the consequences are not critical right now, everything is getting worse. This may lead to the diversion of some ships which will increase the transition cost by 5%. Doesn't sound like a whole lot, but it's $1.1 billion per year. And the average duration will increase by 21%. Our world depends on supply chains. Everything from an iPhone in your hands to an orange in your fridge should find its way to be delivered from producer to consumer. In this video, I tried to show you how humanity can shape continents, but still can't overcome other people's interests and nature's whims. The Suez and Panama Canals are the best examples of humans' might and weakness. However, there are other stories to be told. Maybe we'll look into them next time. Thanks for watching.